jump right in. New York Empire experts. Um, Tuesday night, we have a very, very special panel. It's funny, I say that every week because it's true. Um, Dr. Dennis Cardone, it's interesting, Dr. Cardone, I'm gonna introduce you as the, initially as the co-director of the Concussion Center because the, the, I hope to our credit, the number of times we call you is far less for an orthopedic injury related to you know, mechanics than it is to, to accidental acute injuries like concussions. So amazing to have you here for, for a few reasons. One, um, and here we go with the emotional bit, right? Um, I met you when I was the varsity baseball coach at Hunter High School, my alma mater. And you walk in, and I'm going to be honest, the PSAL was never known for bringing the best of the best to anything. It's, hey, listen, we're the public schools. You get what you get. And in walks Dennis Cardone from NYU Langone. And I'm sitting in the front row like, you know, the, the nerdy kid. And I'm just thrilled because all of a sudden this breath of fresh air walks in and says, this is what I do for the PSAL. I'm the medical director. And my door is open. Here's my phone number. Here are the resources from NYU for anyone in the PSAL. Children, coaches, call me. I'm here. And these are my areas of expertise. And if I don't know, I mean, I remember this like you said this yesterday, right? If, you, if I don't know something, NYU Langone is one of the world leaders in sports medicine. And you were humble. You said, I'm just one of the specialists. And I said, I, I, I was it was as magnetic and exciting for me as just a baseball coach because here came expertise and caring. And I know this probably speaks to a lot of what parents think about the, the healthcare system as it is now. You go see a doctor, you see a physician's assistant, you, you, you're holed up with nobody. The doctor sees you for about eight seconds because he needs to see 30 patients in the next three hours. Otherwise, the numbers don't work. And you were the opposite. And it was, here are my resources. Here's my expertise. I'm an open door. You know, it's an open door. Please use me to help all of your organizations. And there was no benefit to you. And I said, this is, I, I mean, I could not have been happier as a baseball coach. I could not have been happier at my role at New York Empire Baseball because you, you held true every, you've held true to everything that you promised that day. And I remember the very first time I reached out to you. I remember the second time. I remember the third time because it was when my own niece needed something orthopedically and there were no appointments. You said, when she can come in is when I'll see her. And I was so touched on a personal level. And it's the way you've taken care of everyone that we've ever referred to concussion. Um, I think the world of you, and we were on a panel together as James noted, and I had a blast doing it with you because the truth is, Dr. Cardone, I'm going to say this in front of everyone on this call and everybody that ever watches it forever. You have elevated New York Empire Baseball without even trying. And you've made me smarter. And you have been a credit to every kid that walks in and out of our program. So thank you for, for all you've done up to now. And thank you for being here with us tonight. Oh, my goodness. Thank you for having me. You know, listen, I, I'm really, I'm going to have to break out the Kleenex. I, I have like tears in my eyes. I only wish my mother could have, could have heard all this. Yeah. But uh, no, truly, thank It's It's been such a wonderful relationship. And, uh, you know, not, you know, again, everyone knows, but, you know, what you do for, for the youth athletes in the city is just, it's just wonderful. And, and believe me, uh, we, I am honored just to be a part of that. So, so thank you. And especially again for tonight, the invitation. Thank you. And I'll, I'll add some icing to the cake when, I met the team over at the Sports Performance Center and the conversation started there. One of my first questions before I agreed to become pitching consultant to, to the Langone Sports Performance Center was, is Dr. Cardone involved? <laughs> and how do you know Dr. Cardone? And it, it was beyond exciting to, to continue that connection and then you know, be on the panel with you. So thank you again for being here. This has really been special. True. Yeah, don't, don't, truly, truly a pleasure. And the PSAL is such a wonderful part of what I do, truly. You know, I grew up in Queens and I'm a product of, you know, all public schools and, you know, play, got the opportunity to play some basketball at John Adams High School. And uh, so it's great for me to feel like I'm, I'm, I'm paying back a little bit or giving back to what really was great, great memories for me growing up. Amazing.
Well, now we've got, and it's funny because I'm just going to call you Dr. James, right? That's all anybody says. Dr. James, um, thrilled to have met you as well from day one. Um, the reason that we knew that you would be a credit to our organization um, was the same thing. The sense of caring and, and your genuine concern for each and every athlete, it was never one size fits all. It continues to never be one size fits all. We never think in terms of how can we just scale this and, and, and see as many athletes as we can. You care about each and every athlete and the time that you commit to all of them has been extraordinary. And best of all, you weren't only a cultural fit for us as an organization for that caring, but maybe more so for your intellectual curiosity and your drive to learn consistently and, and understand what we don't know. It's my favorite thing about us. You, you make us all smarter um, and you're humble about it. So beyond thrilled to have you here. And I know that I speak on behalf of all of the kids that are on this call and the parents who have already engaged with you. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for everything you do. You have made our athletes stronger and faster and maybe most importantly, healthier. So thanks for being here. Thank you so much. And it means a lot for me growing up in Staten Island. I'm also a PSAL alum. I went to Staten Island Tech. So this is, this is really special for me to be a part of this. And it's really full circle for me. And Jordan, I have so much respect for you as a, as a professional and the dedication that you have for your kids and the way that you use your mind and your resources. And it's just, you know, I, I've learned so much from you. Uh, you taking me under your wing to really educate me on pitching mechanics and how we can combine our skill sets together. It's been really special for me and it's an honor to be doing this with you, Dr. Cardone. So thank you for having me. Well, thank you both. So let's, let's jump right in. And this is going to be a very Dr. Cardone question and it's number one on the list. Um, and it's been asked over and over and over and it's not, why does my kid's elbow hurt? That comes later tonight. Um, I'm going to preface it with this because I've been now a coach and, and a player and so on and so on. When I was growing up and when all of the parents on this call were growing up, a concussion was only the, the number one question was, did he black out? Oh, no. Then he didn't have a concussion. Hey, get back on the field. You'll be fine. You know, and the words now were, you know, be a man or your team needs you. Right. So the question came in and it was, how do I know if my child has had a concussion? How do you diagnose a concussion as a parent? And what do I do when my kid has a head injury? So let's go. You know, so I, I, I always like to start to say, because concussion has been so in the news, as we all know, over the past, you know, even five to 10 years already. And I want to say the most important thing is, is that we all promote sports, right? So no matter what we hear about concussion and contact sports, I always like to put it out there that, you know what, as long as we're promoting sports and we shouldn't be scared by concussion and parents that shouldn't be scared about having their child participating even in contact sports. But there's just a safe way to do it. And, and I think that's what we're all about, right? It's just safety in our sports and, and for our athletes. But, you know, concussion comes in many, many different varieties. And, and, a key, and a couple of key takeaways are, you know, when somebody does have a head injury, it's very difficult at the time of injury to even uh, tell if that's going to be a significant or serious head injury, concussion, or if it's just going to be a mild injury, meaning how long it will take to recover. But in the acute stage, the key is to think about mental status. You know, is there one, is there any change in the mental status of your child? Nobody knows that child, that athlete, obviously better than a parent or a coach or, or, or you know, whoever they're spending a lot of time there. It'd even be an athletic trainer. But the things to look for as well, the common symptoms, headache, uh, confusion, dizziness, uh, they, they look a little bit starry eyed, you know, when you look in their eyes, when you see someone on the sideline who's had a concussion, you know, they're in some far distant place. Early on, the first couple of days, there's usually a loss of balance as well. They may be staggering a little bit. They'll have trouble remembering. They may lose their short term memory. Um, and if you're not used to it, you may think they're only like, sometimes you think they're just fooling around with you, but it's just amazing how they can become, you know, that amnesia part can become a part of this. And they can be, suddenly become very sad. They can become very emotional. And even the, at nighttime, when they've had a headache, uh, when they've had a concussion, they might sleep more, they might sleep less. So those are your common symptoms. What's the big red flag, the big takeaway? Because most of the times, <clears throat> excuse me, athletes do not need to go to emergency room. They're very, very stable. 
There's no reason to take them to an emergency room, but it's really if whatever symptoms they're having, if they're worsening. So all those symptoms we spoke about, if they're stable, and oftentimes they may even be improving after an hour or two, but if they're worsening, if the headache's getting worse, if their nausea, vomiting's getting worse, if whatever symptoms their balance is getting worse, that's a concern to us. And that's when we say to take that athlete to the emergency room. So is it safe to just jump right back on the field because the kid says, I, I got to finish the game? Because that we see it all the time. I mean, I could share a horror story from when I was a coach. Uh, a kid got hit with a ball during warm-ups in the side of his head. No ice. Don't worry. I'm fine. And I'm going to share this story because it, it really is a horror story. Um, in the first inning, and this had to be 20 minutes later, Dr. Cardone, a ground ball got hit down the first baseline, and the first baseman stood there as if he were frozen. And the, everyone's yelling at this first baseman, get the ball, get the ball. Kids running around the bases, and I'm a third base coach at this point, and I knew what was about to happen. He was completely unresponsive. Kids running around the bases. He's not turning around. He's not responding to his name and took him to the floor immediately, and he started to convulse. And by everyone else's account, it was, well, you get hit in the head, give him some ice, he'll be fine, return to play. How could any of that possibly happen as a result of getting hit with a baseball? Right? That's not a concussion, right? I didn't fall and hit my head. I didn't black out. None of those things happened. And I don't think people take them, you know, head injuries seriously because they don't quite understand that even a swelling on the brain from the impact of a baseball can be disastrous. Well, you know, you, make a, you really make a lot of good points there. And, and one big takeaway that we hear all the time is that there was no loss of consciousness, so it wasn't a concussion. And 90% of concussions have no loss of consciousness. So that's not even an important risk factor. And even loss of consciousness doesn't even make it a, necessarily a bad concussion or a very serious concussion. But your other point is exactly that, that a second hit to the head before there is recovery, whether it's acutely the same day or a week or two or three weeks later, that's the big concern. So when you look at acutely, when you look at the same day, there have been many studies that have shown if an athlete doesn't speak up after their first hit and they sustain a concussion and they stay out there or they come back in the game the same day, and they take a second hit, we know for sure their recovery is going to be significantly prolonged and they're going to have significantly worse, more serious symptoms as well. So that's why the whole big piece about concussion that we do is education. You know, we educate the athletes, especially the parents, coaches, you know, and the PSAL athletic directors, whatever it is, because it's really about an understanding. You know, the problem is they're not fooling anyone but themselves if they stay in the game and they don't tell anyone that they had a head injury. They're, again, it's going to be a more serious head injury if they get hit again and a more prolonged recovery. I and mean, look, we say all the time, short-term versus long-term, are you willing to sacrifice the next inning or five or six for a lifetime of enjoyment of, uh, of baseball? And the reality is, look, he's, as a PSAL coach, I think we may – we may have to send it out after this, the CDC videos on concussion, where there's one video where a 15 year old boy suffers a concussion, goes right back to practice the next day, finishes the game, practices all week, complains of headaches. And the parents in this video say, well, of course you have headaches. You know, you got hit in the head at the football game the other day. And five days later, he is in a coma and winds up a, a, a quadriplegic as a result of a concussion. And that I never forgot that video. And it's why I'm as uh, some people call it paranoid. I call it realistic. Right. So should coaches and parents be paranoid about injuries like that? Yeah. I mean, you know, one, I did see someone wrote a message that I was, am I fading in and out by any chance? Is my, it's okay. You're good. I'm good. Okay. Yeah. You know, I wasn't going to bring it up. There, there is something called second impact syndrome, which, um, you know, which really speaks to that, especially in the younger ages, 15 and younger, where if they take a hit, you, and Jordan, you, you spoke about it perfectly, you know, the first hit, the brain swells, and it's in this enclosed cranium. There's no, ultimately, if it takes a second hit and more swelling, it's in this enclosed space where there's no room now for the brain to, to continue to swell. So that's when bad things really happen. And this second impact syndrome 
can really lead to even, you know, unfortunately to say, but can even lead to death of an athlete. So that's why it's so important to take them serious. And as soon as any athlete, and we teach, again, we teach all the coaches, parents, players, if you even suspect that you have a concussion, it's not even important to make the diagnosis. But if you even suspect it, absolutely come out of the game and there is no return to back to the field, back to sports for a minimum of 24 hours. And as you know, all 50 states even have that same mandate, uh, same laws about that. So a suspected concussion, removed from the field immediately, no return for a minimum of 24 hours. And it should be a healthcare, a health professional evaluation before returning back to the field. So should parents be worried down the road, a year down the road, five, 10 years away, the child had one concussion, do they need to do anything differently? You know what, the simple answer to that is no. And you, you know, the, the media in some sense hypes up a lot about CTE, right? Chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So you know what, if an athlete has one, two, three concussions, you know, truly it wouldn't be something to be concerned about, you know, 10, 15, 30, 40 years down the road. But it usually is more, more concussions than that. And the current thought too is maybe it is not even concussions, but it's what we call these sub-threshold hits to the head that aren't enough to cause concussion, but they're having them repeatedly. So the example would be somebody who plays football from a very young age, and they're having these constant hits, impacts on the head. So that's why when you look at you know, youth football, when you look at college football now, and, and professional football, they're having much more limited contact practices in order to decrease that overall number of hits to the head. Let's, uh, let's start to head in a, a, a less morbid direction here. Please. Um, although, look, I, I, it's the reality of concussion, so I'm, thank you for being so candid. Um, just to kind of finish that up, can mouth guards prevent traumatic head and brain injuries and concussions? Like, should kids be wearing mouth guards? Yeah, yeah, one word, no. So it cannot. I mean, athletes should wear mouth guards, absolutely, in contact sports for sure, you know, but it's not about preventing head injury and concussion. Right. Um, one other medical question before we get into arms and health and strength and, and, and conditioning. Um, at what age should a child begin, a male child begin wearing a protective cup? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my answer, but I'm going to throw it back at you as well, right? Because there's some, I think for boys, you know, obviously there's some concern if they're in the locker room with their other boys, you know, about we're potentially wearing a cup and I'm the only one wearing a cup. So the thought process is, and if you speak to any of the urologists or any of us, in, of us in sports medicine, that we'd already say by age seven or eight in contact sports, whether it's baseball, wrestling, football, lacrosse, whatever it should be, they should start getting comfortable and used to wearing a cup, right? And they come in very many different varieties. They're comfortable now. You can wear them with compression shorts. So they should get used to it. The problem is, you know, if a testicle gets hit direct, the testicle can fracture, it can have a torsion, you know, so it doesn't take that much for a young athlete to lose a testicle. So yes, you certainly by age seven or eight, but if that's difficult at that age to introduce, you know, I'm going to talk candid, you know, the testicle at that age is held very close to the body. As they get older, when they start getting closer to puberty, 12, 13 years old, then the testicle is not as protected by the body. So certainly by ages 12, 13, when they're getting closer to start a puberty, then they absolutely should be wearing a cup of protection. Yeah, I mean, as far as we're concerned, if you're getting on a baseball field, we don't require it. We highly recommend that you wear a cup. There's no question, right? For us, there's no, you know, how many players we've come across that say either, A, it's not comfortable, and they're a new, like when you and I were growing up, forget it, you looked like you were riding a horse wearing one of them, right? It was the worst thing in the world. Um, but now they're, they're far more comfortable. They fit in compression shorts. If you're five years old getting on a baseball field, it's just another toy mom will buy you, and it's if you're a one in a million, let's not be the one in a million, right? I'm a big value investor on this one, right? I can't replace this product. So how about we just never have any risk? Even if it's one in a million, the one in a million is not a good situation. So let's just be careful on this one. Protect it. Yep. 
Okay. So this, game and this practice is, this also, I, would, I have a personal story in college. Uh, I saw a guy in practice hit a ball straight down and came straight back up uh, on him. So that was in a practice. So don't just think like I'm going into a game. Now I'll throw my cup on. I would say practice and game. Why risk? You know, you're, you spend more of your time in practice than in games. So you might as well practice what you're going to wear in the game. Yeah, I mean, when you started at a young age, it just becomes, you know, part of the gear that you wear. It becomes, it's not even a second thought. And that, that's the, and that's why to even begin it at age seven, at age eight. So it's just part, they know when you do a contact sport, hey, that's just part of your gear, part of your outfit. Awesome. So this is going to go out to both of you because, um, Dr. Gordon, you'll come at this, obviously, from a medical perspective. And, and Dr. James, this is going to be all about what you and I live through every day. Um, here we go. Is rest and return the right pres prescription for arm pain? And, and I added in, or any other pain, right? Um, because consistently we have athletes that come to us, say, hey, I need your help. We know you're the, the, the pitching medical expert, blah, blah, blah. Um, my coach said I have a, a, a baseball elbow, right? And um, my doctor said same thing and he said, just rest. And when it stops hurting, you can go back and play again. And what's, is that the right prescription for arm pain? So the, the rest piece, sure. But the return piece without doing any intervention is, uh, you're, you're, going to jump right back to where you started so really it's a it's a matter of root cause analysis so can you get to the underlying factor that's causing your arm pain and we're, i'm sure we're going to dig much deeper into that later on because there's so many factors and we can break it down into different categories of what can be causing your arm pain because there are so many different so many different ways that you can go wrong um but i would say rest sure but the return piece do that root cause analysis first figure out why you're in pain in the first place because pain is just your body's way of signaling hey there's something going on here and we have to address it yeah i no, totally agree you know and the things that i would add would be you know especially when we all know when you do sports medicine long enough and you work with athletes you know, as we all know, the last thing you want to say to an athlete is, hey, you know what, don't, don't do anything, right? So it's always good, even from a young age, to have them start to do some kind of cross training or something to maintain some sort of fitness, aerobic capacity, some strength, even when they're recovering from some injury. You know, it's kind of interesting, we could break it down just a little bit, you know, certainly muscle tendon type injuries, we're much more, it's rare nowadays that we ever say, all right, rest this for so long. You know, it's pretty much almost rehab from day one, you know, maybe just a few days and, and then really begin a rehab program. You know, and certainly I know, James, you were talking about more and agree, you know, with like some of the growth plate injuries, little league elbow, you know, little league shoulder, and some of the ligament injuries that, that we'll talk about. You know, those are the ones that you really do need to say you are, you know, unfortunately, that's a shutdown, you know, that's a shutdown for, for a period of time. And then at the same point, maybe, you know, but still working and keeping that athlete in, in good condition and maybe working other areas that, that I know Jordan and James, you could talk to uh, better than I can about keeping the core strong and, and other accessory type muscle groups. So, you know what, since you said it, I'm gonna jump ahead and, and yeah, you know what, Dr. James, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come right at you. You and I had a case together, a pitcher with arm pain. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because it is cutting edge in baseball research this week. You and I had a case of a player with medial elbow injury inside of the elbow. And you looked at him and said, I have to evaluate your lower body. I'm looking at everything else. The cause of your pain is in your lower body. I'm willing to bet that of the hundred some odd people that are on this call right now, they're all thinking this guy's out of his mind and he's looking to be groundbreaking and say something interesting when, Hey, how could it possibly be? My kid's pain is right here. He has little league elbow. His pediatrician said so. And here you are telling me that somebody has, and I'll use the fancy words, uh, a hip internal rotation issue in his left hip and that's the cause. Or somebody else you said had a lower back extension issue. I'm trying to remember everything you said. Um, two different people, same injury, 
and you looked at one lower back and one left hip. What's going on, Dr. James? Yeah, so I, I think we might as well just kind of break this down into different different components so we can really dive into this. So when we're looking at elbow shoulder pain, specifically with pitchers, but baseball players in general, I think we can break it down into three different categories in, in my mind. Is this an issue of volume? Is this an issue of mechanical pitching or throwing mechanical breakdown? Or is this a kinetic chain issue? So is there somewhere along the chain where you're lacking in some type of mobility, stability, strength that's not allowing you to perform any baseball task with proper efficiency? So talking about volume, are you, so we can talk about this in terms of acute and chronic workloads. So more simply, are, do you have, did you build that base of throwing that allows you in an acute, in a single game setting to throw 70 pitches? If, you, if you've only built up a base for, okay, I had an outing, I threw 25, I threw 25, I threw 35, and then your acute, your small sample size volume spikes in comparison to your three month window, that's a, that's a recipe for disaster. So you have to build your base of throwing. So that's our volume box. So now moving on to our pitching, and this is Jordan's specialty, but I'm, I've definitely learned a lot from Jordan and just from studying on my own. If we have a pitching mechanical breakdown, you know, we, we can see someone who has an electric arm. They can long toss 300 feet. They can, you know, they can pull down, you know, 80, 85, 90 miles an hour. They get on the mound and they're throwing in the 70s. What's going on? There's a breakdown somewhere. We know that their arm has the capacity, but they're breaking down on the mound. And uh, I mean, that could be a whole talk on its own of where pitching mechanical deficiencies can happen. So that's another box that we can check. And then the last box is that kinetic chain mobility, stability, and strength, and that's what my primary role is with with Empire. And really, we the and the coaches at Empire do a great job of teaching. Force is produced from the ground, and it's released either with a throw or a swing. Right. So for some, the energy has to transfer from the ground through our hand. And if there's a leak of energy, if there's some inefficiency somewhere along that chain, your body's still going to do whatever it has to do to get that job done. And it's going to put increased stress on your elbow, on your shoulder, if you have an inefficiency somewhere else. So that's our, the third box that I would touch on here. So Dr. Cardone, is there reality to the, the athletic development and strength and mobility world as an orthopedic surgeon? Um, is there reality to a lower body injury can cause an upper extremity uh, uh, problem or a lower, a lower extremity, you know, deficiency, right? can cause a, an upper extremity uh, uh, pain. Is that real? Yeah, you know, as much, you know, we're, you know, coming from a university setting, you know, one of our biggest things is, is evidence and studies, right? So again, when you look at the sports, you know, orthopedic literature, whatever it might be over the past decade, you know, it really, you know, these problems that when I was doing my training, it seemed to be so localized, you know, like you said, whether we talk about a elbow ligament injury or a shoulder tendon injury, you know, it's really, you know, the rehab has changed so much and the training and, and what you do, Jordan, you know, is just great because we've all learned, you know, that's, that's only the sign, that's the breakdown point, but that's only just a small part of, of the stress that, that's loaded on that, on that point. So you're absolutely right. It comes from the core. It comes from the lower extremity. You know, it's, it really is the whole body working together. And again, that's where that whole training principle and what you're doing just makes such a big difference. Okay. So, you know, you, you, Dr. James, you mentioned it. Um, how much is too much in terms of sports or one sport? And, and is there such thing as an overuse injury? And I'm going to sort of jump in for a second here first and then kick it back out to you guys. You know, we like to think about things. You talk about overuse. Overuse is more of an issue as far as I'm concerned um, when you're either doing something wrong mechanically um, or you do have a strength or, and mobility concern somewhere else, anywhere else in the body. Right? You have a muscle imbalance from front to back, top half to bottom half. You, you don't have some mobility in your hips and you're trying to accomplish a task like you said. You know, I, I, use, I use my wife as an example all the time. You know, she throws a football on the beach three times and she's not mechanically perfect. Right? Is she going to have a, an injury? No, even though she's doing it very wrong potentially. Well, the overuse becomes a problem, right? If, 
someone with poor mechanics were to go out and do it a hundred times every Saturday and never address the fault, then they'll have an overuse injury. So it's not the use by itself that's the problem. It's the overuse combined with a mechanical or strength and mobility failure. A am I along the right lines from a, from a medical standpoint? So what's too much? Do you have to combine things to, to make them a problem? Where are we at in terms of too much? All right, so I'll, I'll start, I'll open. Um, you know, we, we are seeing injuries in, in seven and eight year olds that, that were unheard of, you, you know, years ago because, because of sports specialization and doing, we'll call it too much. Um, injuries that, you know, we wouldn't have seen until at least a 15 year old or a 20 year old we're seeing in our younger athletes, everything from muscle strain overuse to ACL tears. Um, to, you know, again, we could talk about multiple injuries, UCL injuries, growth plate injuries. So there are some really nice guidelines. And, and again, that whole, that's a whole conversation unto itself, sports, special, sports specialization and, and the negative part about sports specializing. But I'll tell you who's done a really nice job about, you know, in terms of preventing these injuries and really put out some good guidelines. It's the NATA, the, the National Athletic Trainers Association. And, you know, and just a few of the principles, and I'll just go really quickly, are, you know, not to do the same sport more than five days a week, not to do the same sport more than eight months of the year, only to do that sport uh, according to age, whatever age they are, that's the number of hours of, week, of the week they should be doing it. So if they're eight years old, eight hours per week. Um, so, and, and mixing it up, you know, playing on only one team at a time and, and trying to introduce other sports. So to get the best athlete, you know, it's probably, the, it, it is these athletes, when you look at the professional, whatever sport it is, you know, they're not a single sport athlete growing up. They're the ones, you know, they played baseball, but you know what? They also played soccer or they played basketball. They did some other sport. So not only does it help prevent overuse type injuries, but it also builds up muscular development and neuromuscular development as well. Um, and also just whole mental attitude. So there's a lot we could talk about, um, but those are some of the key principles. So it's great. I see Dr. James has, has a, a smile from ear to ear when you started to touch on what, you, you know, the benefits of multi-sport and I'll come back to it, but Dr. James, go ahead. Yeah. So just going back for a sec, you took the words right out of my mouth about overuse. So not just the factor of too much, but just too, into, too much with poor mechanics. And I think that's perfectly said in terms of sport special, specialization. I mean, I would, I would argue that you, you never really specialize in a sport. I mean, uh, kids, when I'm when I'm with you at at the arena, I love taking out the football and tossing it around with the guys because you know that's just a great way to work on arm path. Potentially, I love you know when you see pro athletes that are playing ping pong to work on their coordination. I love when they're playing basketball for conditioning and just working on different movement patterns. I think that even professionals, I mean, specialize meaning you know you just focus all your time and energy on one sport, but I think you never truly specialize because playing different sports. It, it gives you the capacity to be an overall better mover and a better athlete um, to kind of nerd out, I guess, if, if we're talking about, you know, a, a sport like baseball versus something like um, very close like chess, uh, baseball and other team sports are very open tasks and chess is very confined. So you can memorize moves in chess and you can specialize by just mem memorizing gameplay and strategy and that'll work very well in chess because you can become a grandmaster by just memorizing moves and specializing and just focusing on that. But in baseball and other sports that are very open environments, I mean, you might never see the same scenario twice, you know, and the way that baseball is now, I mean, you might not even face the same pitcher twice in one game. So the, if you have the capacity to be an athlete, no matter what sport you're playing, I think that's, I think that's huge. Yeah, I, I mean, we, we talked about it last week on, on uh, New York Empire Experts, the, the concept, and everybody expects me to say, you need to specialize from four years old so you can be the best baseball player you could be, and you should be with us 365 days a year. Well, no, if you're going to be with us 365 days a year, we have a basketball hoop and a ping pong table and football, and we have all those things in the arena, not because we're becoming New York Empire football or New York Empire ping pong or New York Empire basketball. It's so that people will be well-rounded, joyful athletes because the athlete component comes first. You become a great baseball player after you have the foundation of, of athleticism. So it's really interesting that both of you headed down the road of non-specialization 
when we the question began with overuse. I, I'm amazed by that because I think it, it does. It's what we talked about right at the top of the hour. You become a healthier, better specialist by being having a, a, an athletic foundation to begin with. Um, yeah, and the other thing I would add with overuse where, where I think, you know, where you both were going, which is so key is, you, you know, again, when I did my training, you know, weight training, for example, lifting, uh, what was taboo in, in children. And there was a thought of growth plate injuries. But, you know, now we know a seven-year-old, an eight-year-old, you know, whatever it might be. And again, you can speak to this even better, but, you know, a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old, they should be doing some form of weight training in a very controlled environment, in a very safe environment. And, and that's to both avoid injury, avoid these overuse injuries, and also to improve skills. Yep. Yeah. So, two, two. Go ahead, Dr. Jane. Yeah, that, yeah, that jumps ahead in our questions, right? We had somebody. I'm so sorry. I keep jumping ahead. I, I oh, thought I was actually going backwards. I'm so sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'm so excited because this was one that we've heard, we had heard for years. Anytime we launched, and Dr. James, when you and I first met, I said to you, workout classes have never been popular in all of our years, even though we know internally that building the athletic foundation is job one. And we got it. It's my son is young and athletic and he's eight. He doesn't need to warm up or work out, get him out on the field. What do you think? Yeah, it's, it's something that we definitely hear a lot, but as Dr. Cardone talked about training, working out training at a young age is definitely been debunked. We, I mean, we at the arena, we talk about how if we can first preach moving with optimal efficiency, authentic efficiency for someone's body then if they're eight nine years old and we can throw a you know a, you know, a six pound med ball in their hands if we can throw a 10 pound kettlebell in their hands why not load their body and have them accept some external load because they're going to go out into the field when you're sprinting your body is absorbing loads that are five to seven times your body weight when you're sprinting when you're on the field your goal is to never be unprepared for a demand that your body is about to encounter. So we want our capacity to be as high as possible because we want to be prepared for any level of demand that we're going to face on the field. And if we can start to ingrain that at a young age, I think that's an amazing thing. Um, going back to your point about, you know, my, my son doesn't want to warm up. He doesn't want to train the warm up piece. I think we do a great job at the arena of saying our warm up prepares us for the movements that we're about to do when we train, when we throw, when we hit, so our movements prepare us for what we're about to do. And then in terms of training itself, um, yeah, I, I think it not only, I, I think it's interesting because as youth athletes, you have this amazing opportunity to be part of a team and to work out. But as we get older, sometimes that goes away. So if we ingrain this now, we build lifelong habits of exercise and fitness. And that's something that we really need in this country today. I mean, with obesity and chronic conditions being such a major issue, if we can ingrain healthy training habits at a young age, that goes way past youth team sports. Dr. Gardon, do, do, do seven and eight-year-olds, I mean, you said it a little while ago, do seven and eight-year-olds really need to warm up and work out, or are they just seven and eight and they go play? <laughs> so the answer is yes, they, they, they do need a warm up, right? We do know like a warm up period and it's not about stretching. It really is about a warm up period is a good thing. And I think, you know, just like Dr. James is saying, it's good to build these habits from a young age as well. So we know in order to avoid injury, you know, there is a certain warm up period that does make sense before all activities. So yes, I, th I think it is good. The reason why I hesitate and I was laughing, you know, is because there's big controversy about like stretching and stretching at a time before uh, sports and activity has the potential to maybe even increase risk of injury. But a warm up period, as we all know, absolutely that's essential. And, it, and at the very youngest of ages to already get that ingrained, that's important. Awesome. So, you know, you both touched on it. What's age appropriate for, for working out? If, if people are going to do it, what should they be doing? Five, eight, 10, 12, 15 years old? What are they doing? Yeah, so I think this is, this is a great point because I would never just throw a number out there because we could get uh, a 14 year old that says, trained a day in his life. So we have to compare biological age versus training age. 
So our nine-year-old who has worked to develop great movement patterns, maybe more ready for load for training than a 14-year-old who's never trained. So there may not necessarily be a number. It really is a matter of working with a professional that you trust that says, okay, you're at the age now where you have good movement patterns. Let's, let's try weights. Dr. Cardone, you, you started to mention it. Are, are you okay with weights? Yeah, that- no, no, absolutely. And, you know, especially in younger, in younger children, I, I think it, it is very appropriate. But at that age group, they should have some good guidance, right? They really should have someone uh, who's kind of coaching them through it. And obviously not just throwing a team into a weight room at that young an age, but they really need to have some education and doing, obviously, lower weight, more repetition. You know, and, it, and it's important for them to understand and parents understand and, you know, and, and you know, it's not about at that point muscle development because they're not going to get big muscles. It's not going to happen in an eight-year-old, nine-year-old, ten-year-old. You know, not until they're testosterone in boys. You know, they hit puberty or girls the same thing. Puberty. You know, are they going to really start developing big muscles? But weight training, you know, is a big part of it. And Dr. James wrote up a great point. It's not so much age as it is, you know, just even you know mental development, physical development, readiness. You know, and a good example when you were talking, Dr. James, that I was thinking about was. Um, we have a, and I'm not plugging in anyway, we have a dance center at NYU. And I always ask them, because I don't, I don't really, I don't spend much time at the dance center, but I always ask them, well, what age do you get, you know, the, the young girls on point? You know, when do you get them up on tiptoe? And interestingly, they'll say the same thing. You know, it's really not about age. It's really about both a combination of physical, mental maturity. Um, so same sort of thing here. So Dr. James, Dr. Cardone just said something that, I should send up a red flag for you, or I need you to explain it. Uh, he said, pre-testosterone, you can lift weights, you will not build muscle. If that's the case, Dr. James, what's the point? Because you're both advocating it, and it sounds like it's just to build good habits. Is that all I'm, I'm accomplishing? Or why am I lifting weights at 8, 9, 10 years old? Oh, that's, that's a good point. It's, I think there's two ways that you can look at it. You can say, okay, maybe I'm not – physically building muscle mass the way that I will, you know, once my testosterone kicks in, but I'm increasing my neural recruitment. I'm increasing the amount of muscle fibers that I can recruit at once to perform a certain task. So just that, that factor of being able to tap into your body's greatest capacity is something that happens within a short amount of time. So if that happens in adults to start training, they see gains in their, and what they're able to weight. It may not be necessarily in that short time frame that we're putting on mass, but we're uh, tapping into our body's ability to recruit the proper amount of muscle fibers at the correct time. So our timing improves. Um, and then also, I think it's a great way, like I mentioned before, just even though they're not maybe putting on the mass like they would post testosterone, they are learning how to accept load because that's what they're doing when they're sprinting. That's what they're doing on any athletic field. You grab a rebound, you come down, you're accepting load. So uh, learning how to do that at, at a young age, I think is absolutely huge. Amazing. Thank you. So Dr. Grandon, let's go back to some of the injuries here. Um, and I know this is on everybody's mind. Here we go. What causes elbow and shoulder pain in a youth athlete, thrower, and pitcher? And I know Dr. James touched on it a little bit. He said, hey, it could be mechanical. It could be strength and mobility issues. Can you be more specific? Why, why are kids having elbow pain and shoulder pain, particularly when they throw and pitch, to the point where some parents walk in the door and say, my son can play every position but pitcher because I don't want his elbow to hurt. What's going on? Yeah, you know, and, and as, as we've been talking about, it's a combination of factors, right? So, you know, one, overuse is certainly the most important thing here. And then biomechanics, right? And, and everything we've been talking about this whole time about how to really, we've been talking about preventing injury, right? Doing, doing strength training, uh, proper biomechanics, proper throwing mechanics, um, and, and you know what? Sometimes no matter how careful you are, that we're, go- we're going to see injuries. You know, as you, Little League Baseball, you know, in the PSAL, listen, we have pitch counts, right? So we have studies that say, hey, you know what? It's also about number of pitches, quantity of pitches, and especially fastballs now, right? From years ago, as they talked about all the curveball, but now it's really about quantity of fastballs and just being pre- preparing that athlete. You know, I think a problem with a lot of coaches and, you know, no, 
certainly not you, Jordan, truly, you know, is, you know, some of the athletes, listen, they mature faster and they, and they excel, you know, they're great pitchers and then they just get overused, right? And we see that time and time again. So everybody's going to break down if you put enough stress across whatever joint, muscle, tendon, ligament, you know, no one's superhuman and everyone's going to break down at some point. So it's about a combination of factors to protect against these overuse type injuries. Dr. James, any, any thoughts on, on elbow and shoulder pain causes? Yeah, I, I think we, we started to dive into it before when we were talking about the, the whole kinetic chain, but I, w- I would argue that you, you have to earn the right to throw a baseball. If you can't do a perfect push-up, I don't think you really deserve to throw a baseball off a mound. If you can't do a perfect lunge, if you can't single leg squat, if you can't do a perfect pull-up, uh, I think that, you know, we, we kind of underestimate those tools and you may think I'm kind of crazy by saying that, but I, I think that we see so many kids who come in at, you know, 12, 13 years old and they can't stab- stabilize their core, but they're still producing power. And how are they getting that? They're, you know, they're putting excess torque on their elbow, but you know, once you really dive into it and you put them on the ground, like, Oh wow, you can't do a single good push up, or, Oh wow, you can't do a single leg squat, but where you can't lunge and baseball is really a sport about being able to single leg squat and lunge. So uh, I'm kind of radical in that sense where I think you really have to earn the right by doing those, showing that you have competency in those movements. I I just have one word for that answer. Wow. That might be the introductory video to New York empire baseball. If your child can't do these three things, then no, they, they're not getting on the field. We would have, I mean, I think our health record has been extraordinary. I, I like to think so, but I, I, wow. I mean, James, you and I talk for hours on end. I'm, I'm, that's marvelous. I'm, I love what you just said. Um, so, you know, that, that brings us to the next topic. And this is a big one because the word is, is, is all over the place. Tom Brady made it a popular word and all the athletic trainers in the world. And now, you know, uh, Eric Cressy became the Yankees' new uh, athletic, con- you know, conditioning coach or coordinator. Um, what is recovery, and is it important for children? And is my child too young to worry about recovery? And why is it such a hot topic for for athletes? I'm just going to jump in first because I we just talked about about this with the the travel guys this past Saturday morning. We were talking about recovery. And they were doing like a, a pretty tough training session with Coach Chris and Coach Chris. And I hopped on. And I saw they were kind of tired. And I was like, okay, I'm glad I planned to do recovery today. I can let them just kind of talk, talk for like five minutes here. So recovery, I broke down with them in terms of three things, movement, nutrition, and sleep. And I think uh, I brought it up in the context of soreness because we do a lot of training during the week. And I asked, you know, I asked the guys like, Hey, have any of you guys been sore in the last couple months after our workouts? And, you know, everyone kind of raises their hand like, okay, so what, what do you do when you get sore? And then some of the guys had great answers like, yeah, you know, like I'll do some stretching or, you know, maybe I'll, you know, do some of the other movements that we've done in class. And I, that's great. So movement is a great, um, a, a great thing to tap into in terms of, recovery so just doing some type of mobility drills on your off days uh nutrition we talk about you know what's your what's your diet like during the day what's your protein consumption post-workout even just a glass of chocolate milk can sometimes give you what you need post-workout to get your uh, muscle recovery in the right direction and then sleep is so important i mean i I asked the guys this past saturday morning how many of you guys are getting eight eight hours of sleep per night and you know, sleep specifically for baseball, there, there's a study that I saw that guys that are getting eight hours of sleep have uh, much significantly faster reaction times than guys who weren't getting uh, the right amount of sleep. So movement, nutrition, and sleep are, I think, are critical for recovery. I love that answer. I love that. I'm right on, right on. You know, and, you know, interesting, again, you know, when you look at all the, just like you said, of the studies and the evidence and literature over the past few years, you know, sleep is moving right up to the top, you know, in terms of recovery. I mean, it's so huge. You know, and usually when we think of recovery, you know, it's interesting when you talk to elite athletes, especially who are 40 and older, and you say, hey, what's the difference between 40 and 20? You know, they all immediately, the first answer is recovery. But I think exactly, we're recognizing 
uh, that that's a big part at all ages, that recovery. And that also speaks to why when we were talking about sports specialization and not doing more than five days per week even, right, or only a certain number of hours per day, that also speaks to that full recovery piece as well, that that's so important. Um, in preventing, you know, preventing injury and all the things, you know, that Dr. James and, and Jordan, that you're working with these athletes in terms of development, you know, it helps to be a way for, to have that recovery period, to have that proper sleep, nutrition, and have some time away from sport. You know, since it, since it came up, I'm going to share a story and somebody just, I had a smile on my face because somebody just sent me, said, hey, tell my story. Um, we had a, a, a teenage athlete uh, pitcher, driven, ready to work out seven days a week, and not just ready to work out, worked out seven days a week, and got into a throwing program, did a velocity program, and that's a different conversation altogether, got into a velocity program, no no injury, right, everything was fine, and was told, hey, here's your workout, and I know, Dr. James, you're going to be all over this. The, the velocity company gave him a workout. They said, on Mondays, you do your, your weighted balls. On Tuesdays, you do this workout. On Wednesday, you do your weighted balls. On Thursday, you do a workout. On Fridays, you do your weighted balls. Saturday, you do workout. Sunday, go do anything other than anything we talk to you about. And he decided as a teenager, well, if I can gain 10 miles an hour in six months by working out three out of seven days, either I'll gain 20 miles an hour by working out six days a week or I'll get it done in three months instead of six. Needless to say, 79 miles an hour turned into 78 miles an hour after three months. There was no gain. Three months later, 78, 77, 79, there was no gain. Mechanically looked fantastic. Miles per hour never went up. What happened? Yeah, I mean, this is – this speaks this speaks perfectly to this topic of recovery it sounds like the body just never really had a chance to allow for the adaptation to occur and that, that's really what training is training is trying to uh, create a certain adaptation so increasing velocity is an adapt we're adapting our body to throw harder and if we're not allowing for the proper recovery to feed the adaptation that we're looking for then that's the result that you get unfortunately you lose a mile an hour. <laughs> so, Dr. Cardone, I mean, you've seen it at every level. Um, guys getting paid nothing to play and guys getting paid $30 million a year. Um, is recovery the, 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 the holy grail of athletic development? I'll tell you, it's right up there. I have to tell you. It may, you know, right up, right up there with everything Dr. James was saying. Uh, you know, recovery is key. Recovery is really key, just in performance and in terms of injury prevention and, and mental state, right? I mean, it's a big thing also now that we haven't really talked too much about it, but that we're recognizing a lot in, in our athletes at all levels, you know, that whole sh mental stress or proper, you know, just, just you know, having there just a, a good sound uh, for, you know, me mental peace and in terms of just development. So it's key, really key for that. It's something also that we're address, addressing more and more. Well, I'm, I'm glad we were able to get to that because that became a hot button and I love that that question came in as our final one. So with that, um, thank you both. Um, you know, the number of people that reached it's out. Been, to say, thank you so much. You really, it's been a pleasure. Um, and I, I can't even say, you know, what a pleasure to work with you. The experience that we've had with NYU, you've brought so much to, to our performance center. So for all of us at NYU and our performance center, thank you for all that you do. And uh, it's really, thank you for inviting me and, and pleasure to work with you, Dr. James. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Cardone. It was absolutely awesome doing this with you, hearing your perspectives. And Jordan, you know, you always say, you know, you told me in person that, you know, 10 years down the road, if we can look back and say, Hey, you know, we did a good thing here. You know, that's, that's enough for us. It's really just about, you know, doing the right thing by the kids, continuing to gain more knowledge so that we can do right by, by the kids that we care so much about and that we work with. And you're, you're at the top of your game. And I'm, you know, I, I feel honored that I get to work with you and learn from you. Well, the feeling is, wow. Thank you. The feeling is mutual. Thank you for, uh, for making us all what we are. So, have a great night. Thank you again. I will see you both soon. Um, and thanks to, all, to everyone for, uh, for joining New York Empire Experts tonight. Thank you. Yeah.